Okay. Well, hello, Open Chain, and uh, thanks, Shane. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, risk in M and A, uh, and we'll provide some some numbers to uh, to quantify what we're talking about. Um, by way of introduction, uh, I run the Black Duck Audit Group at Synopsys, and I think many of you are probably familiar with Black Duck, maybe fewer with Synopsys. I'll just kind of or orient you there. So Synopsys is about a $5 billion company, mostly building uh, uh, tools for uh, semiconductors. Uh, I'm part of a group called the Software Integrity Group, which builds tools for software and joined as uh, the, with the acquisition of Black Duck, which was about four, four and a half years ago. So within that is an audit group, uh, and that's relevant today because that's where the, the data comes from. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, you know, I talk, I talk a lot about this topic and I have uh, presented these numbers before. And usually I will start with uh, some basics of open source and uh, why uh, it has become so popular as a part of commercial products and what some of the issues are there. Um, but uh, we'll dispense with that for this audience. I think everybody has a pretty good understanding. Um, and, uh, you know, sh uh, Shane, your project had a, had a, a terrific uh, session a few, uh, I guess, probably a month ago now on M&A. So some folks would have been, been part of that. This may be a little review from that, but of course, uh, open source is great, unmanaged, it can be risky. And the implications for M&A is that uh, if uh, unmanaged open source is risky, it's especially an issue for, for smaller companies where bigger companies just in general tend to have more resources to apply to uh, you know, dealing with things other than just getting the product out the door, which is the, the real focus for small companies. Um, I hear from uh, a lot of folks in the M&A community on the acquirer side that uh, uh, deeper pockets may be an issue drawing fire. A, uh, a small company with, with uh, any kind of uh, uh, issue with which you know, someone might have an ax to grind um, may be an uninteresting company to sue. Um, but once they get bought by a bigger company, um, that can be, uh, you know, shine a light on it. And it's, it's more profitable to go after such a company. Um, some investors, private equity investors, uh, have to think about divestment. Um, <clears throat> and, and all these apply to any issues with the company and not even just within the, the technology of the company. But when, uh, when a private equity uh, firm is buying a company, it is in anticipation of selling at some point. And so uh, any issues they find, they're going to have to deal with along the way. And then uh, Another consideration is just making the business case and, and, and planning integration. So any, any issues with a company um, that will require resources to address uh, need to be figured into, into the planning process. Um, so open source, uh, and, and I, I personally have been involved in uh, working with M&A clients on, on uh, a, a variety of software software issues for, for uh, about eight years. Um, my organization's been at it longer than that. And during that time, uh, considerations of open source have gone, as, as part of M&A deals, have gone from being a bit unusual to really, really being, being the norm. Um, and uh, that includes both, both the, uh, the looking into the processes around managing open source, but, but the code, you know, the code itself. And we'll be, I'll be emphasizing that. And, and uh, certainly, you know, certainly open chain plays a role there in the, in the process piece of that. And we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that. So I, I alluded to the data. It comes from a uh, report that we've been putting out annually for about seven years. And it is based on the software that we see as part of my, my bit of the business, which, which uh, the Black Duck Audit Group uh, provides services to companies generally in an M&A transaction, usually on the buy side, some, sometimes on the sell side of the M&A transaction. And um, so we uh, collect that data up, we anonymize it, we aggregate it together, and uh, we've got a, a cybersecurity 
uh, research center. The topic is not going to be limited to security, but uh, it's uh, this is done under the auspices of our cybersecurity research center that does a lot of work on on identifying uh, open source vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, and uh, the the uh, software uh, that we're talking about is primarily software of technology companies. So. Um, where we get involved is where, and I haven't really defined technology company, but really where the, the software is the business or is a big part of the business. So it's certainly software companies, SaaS companies, system companies, where there's a lot of software in, involved. And uh, there are um, there's some data in here, but a, a very little bit that is outside of the M&A use case. In most, most every one of these audits was companies that were uh, the, the software of companies that were involved in an M&A transaction. Now, uh, this this report is is available. You can go to the Synopsys website. You can read it yourself. And I will say it is code based oriented. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say a little more about that. And and part of what I'm doing with the numbers here is translating or 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 providing both numbers on a code based basis, but also on an M&A transaction basis, which is, would really really uh, be more relevant to, to folks in the M&A space. So code bases and transactions. Um, as I say, the, the, um, the report presents data about code bases, which is roughly equal to applications. Um, you know, the reality is what happens is we, we get into it with a target and an M&A transaction. We figure out how to logically break up all the code that, that uh, uh, comprises you know their products, or their you know, or is uh, the basis of their services, and that that's it's pre a pretty reasonable um, analogy or uh, equation to make it uh, to to think of code bases as applications. But on average, every transaction we're involved with includes four code bases, or or actually a little more than four code ba code bases. So um, in in general, and this isn't a I think it's not a mathematical proof, but I think you can say that in general, there's a greater frequency of any type of issue on a transaction basis than a per code base basis. And the, you know, I got, I've got two analogies here. One is you, uh, if if flipping heads is a problem, you know, and you try it once, and that would be like on a code base, you know, you got a 50-50 shot. But if you if there's four code bases. Um, and you flip the coin four times, there's a much better chance uh, that you'll get heads at least once and that there, that there would be a problem you know, across those four flips or those four code bases. And I, my other analogy was people. If you know, there's a percentage of people in the world with, with blue eyes um, and there's a percentage of family who have somebody, families who have somebody with blue eyes and that's gonna tend to be a higher Percentage, but I say it's not a mathematical proof because I think you can construct odd corner cases with different size, you know, different size families. You know, if you have a family with a hundred people and everybody's got blue eyes, you could you could make a you know make a case that those percentages might be different. But but anyway, we will be talking per um, per transaction as well as per code base, and that's just to sort of translate between the numbers that you would see in the report and what they would mean in terms of implications for M&A transactions. Okay, so into the, into the numbers with, with a bit of wind up there. Um, we looked at about uh, 2,400 code bases, and this is, uh, this is our 2022 report looking back to 2021. Um, and that was uh, something on the order of, of 500 transactions. Uh, a little more than that for technical reasons, there's some you know, some work we did that was eliminated from the from the study, but think of it as about 500 transactions, um, and um, and uh, about uh, m most, but not all of those transactions, including included a security assessment. So when I talk about numbers with respect to license issues, that's on 100% of those transactions, and when I talk about security and some of the other. Uh, operational areas. That's on a large subset of, uh, of uh, you know, call it 85, 87 um, percent. So uh, almost all of the code bases had some open source, and 100 percent of the transactions included some code with open source. And I think for folks in this community, that's not a big surprise. You understand that there's a lot of open source being used, but um, it, I think it is notable that the number is is so high. Um, 
every year that number uh, by code base is, is, is in the sort of 97, 98, 99% range. And I have dug into the code bases that uh, have, have no open source. It's unusual, but not, but, but there are some. Um, and in almost all cases, they're very small code bases, maybe you know, less than a, a thousand files, say. Um, so I think even on a code base basis, you can say that for any, any code base or any application of any size, there's almost 100% chance that there's going to be some open source in there. And just to give you a sense, um, these are the uh, industries of the companies that we audited. Um, they are ranked. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, big ones at the top, enterprise software and SaaS, healthcare, uh, you know, big data, of course, uh, fintech is not a surprise, cybersecurity. Um, all the sort of greatest hits of software these days are, are covered. And then into some, um, and I hate, I, I won't call them obscure, but some less frequent industries, at least in terms of our auditing, would be virtual reality, gaming, um, education, uh, a little less in telecom. Uh, but, but certainly, I want to give you a sense we're covering a, a broad spectrum of industries. So now to talk about, uh, we, we've said that 100% of the code bases uh, or 100% of the transactions and near 100% of the code bases um, had some open source. The question is now how much? And uh, I'm showing that number here on a, uh, on a code base basis. I don't have history by transaction. We just started doing that this year, but on a code base basis, um, it's been monotonically increasing since we started the study. And I think I, this goes back to 2018. I, I hope that shows up okay for you. Um, but uh, I, think, I think the year we started it, um, we, were, we were in the neighborhood of, of uh, 40%. Um, of the, you know, an average code base. And the, and the way we, what this number is, is literally we look at, you know, all the code that we looked at across the year. Um, and uh, if you put it in a big pot and stir it all up, it's, it's uh, this year, 78% um, open source. And, you know, bear in mind, as I said at the beginning, these are companies that are, you know, would probably consider themselves as having proprietary software. Uh, in you know, for the for the most part, at least. Uh, so they are technology companies getting bought by other companies for the value in the software, and uh, and even there, um, you know, about seventy eight percent. So I think you know my my expectation. We don't have good numbers on this, but my expectation is you know in in enterprises, in banks, or you know retailers or insurance companies where most of the software is for their own use. My expectation is that that number is even higher. Um, it can't go too much higher than 78. I think you can see the curve is flattening out and, you know, it, it can't go to 100. Um, so I think, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if it was 77 next year, but it's, uh, you know, nonetheless a high number. Um, and then the next question is what, it, you know, what is that made up of? Um, and uh, it's a lot of components. So on a, on a per code base basis, it's about 500. And then across transactions, and it's not, it's not four times, four plus times 500, but it's about 1700. The reason it's not four times is there is some overlap in, in um, com types of components uh, across, across uh, applications. So uh, I guess it's uh, the, the message here and, and you know, from, the, from the perspective of open chain is uh, the, if we were just talking about 10 components, half a dozen, 20 components, uh, you probably don't need uh, as much of a process as, as is described in the open chain spec. It will, life would be a lot easier, but 500 of anything or 1700 of anything is, is pretty tricky to manage. And so it's, uh, that, that really speaks to why uh, so many companies today still are not doing a very good job or don't have a very good handle on uh, what 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 is making up their code, and our our anecdotal experience um, with targets in M and A transactions um, bears that out. So we uh, uh, we find that uh, few targets are able to produce a list with any confidence. Some targets do produce a list, um, and when they do, it tends to be fifty or sixty percent accurate. Um, sometimes it's vague. 
uh, and I, I won't have to explain this too much, this audience will get, uh, we, we got a list of components uh, from one company a couple of years ago and the, and the first item on the list was Apache. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty vague. Um, it tends to be pretty high level. Uh, you know, certainly if somebody's using the spring framework, they know that, um, they, uh, you know, they know the bigger, it's not surprising that they might know the bigger pieces, but it's often incomplete. And, and, uh, I think, I think you all understand, you know, how, how ubiquitous open source is and how easy it is for developers to use. So if a company is not deliberately trying to manage, they, they're necessarily going to have a, an, an incomplete view. Um, I heard an interesting stat. Um, we just we just had a conference uh, earlier this week, and Steve Hendrick, the VP of Research for the Linux Foundation, spoke uh, about a, a study uh, they had done that he had he had conducted on uh, S bombs. But he also gave kind of a sneak preview of um, the uh, Open SSF study that's that's coming out. Um, and one of the stats he cited, and I think I have this right, is that uh, is that only about fifty percent of companies even have an open source policy, which, to my mind, is table stakes for managing any of this stuff. And uh, and he broke it down further into um, by by size of company, and not surprisingly, uh, the percentage was higher in bigger organizations and and lower in smaller organizations. So that kind of bears out what we're talking about here. So um, license issues, and again, with a with a different audience, I might uh, I might elaborate on what this is about, but I think uh, you all are pretty pretty well tuned in. Um, I will talk about what we mean by uh, unlicensed software and, and custom licenses, um, but uh, let me give you the numbers first, and then I'll define those. So we found it, and and the convention through the slides is I'm tending to keep code bases on the left and transactions on the right. So. Um, 53% of the code bases contained license conflicts, just meaning components whose licenses conflicted with the way that uh, the, the work as a whole was to be licensed. And, uh, and that translated into almost 90% of the transactions having some amount of license conflicts. And in many cases, it was, it was a lot. And then in addition to that, 30% uh, of the code bases had no license or custom licenses. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and that was 71% uh, of on a transaction basis. Um, so <clears throat> I'll also mention, um, I'll also mention dual licenses. So uh, none of these numbers include dual licenses. We do flag dual licenses. I don't have, have data on that, but, but uh, you know, like Mon MongoDB with their, with their, open source license that's that's pretty um, you know commercially difficult um, and then they've got a, uh, a commercial license uh, and there are a number of companies that have that uh, take that approach so we, we flag those and, and suggest they be looked at but we don't call them license conflicts of course they would be if the if if the company didn't have a commercial license then they would be subject to the to the uh, to the uh, open source license, typically reciprocal, and typically they're not following the rules on that. So that would turn into a license conflict, but we haven't included those. Um, so unlicensed or no license and and, um, and custom license. So there, there's a fair amount of software um, available um, for which the copyright holder is expressing no uh, you know, no licensing terms. There's nothing in the comments. There's no license.txt or readme or, or copying file. Um, and there's no, uh, you know, no indication in, in any metadata of what the license is. And so we would call that uh, unlicensed. And that might be code from a blog. That might be uh, code that was in a GitHub repository that just had no associated license. Um, custom licenses are, uh, and sometimes it's a stretch to call it a license, but we will flag uh like comments we find in the code from the from the developer that express um, you know some kind of usage rights and some kind of obligation. So for I remember one for example that we flagged was uh, you know you can you can use my software in your software, but um, you know you should mention me in um, articles in scientific journals and uh, so we we would flag that and and you know depending on the company they might. 
think that's you know benign or they might think no that's an obligation we really can't track and can't make and so that's what i'm talking about in the numbers below the 30 and the 71 percent um just just to give you a sense and i'll not go through these but the um the, the, the licenses we're talking about that, that conflict and you'll not be surprised to see, you know, the, uh, a number of the GPL family in here, um, the Mozilla public license, and then a number of Creative Commons uh, licenses as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, surprising to me because I never think of those as, I don't think they were developed for use with software, but they show up quite a bit. Um, so security is a, a growing focus in m a and these are articles that are kind of once a year over several years where where some business publication will will catch on that security is a big deal in m a and to me it's just you know software security cybersecurity is a big deal everywhere and and what is everywhere is 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 also going to impact m a and then with respect to open source and, and security, you know, high profile vulnerabilities over the years have really focused attention on it in, at, you know, at least sporadically, but, but I think in general, we've certainly seen the heightened sensitivity around, around open source vulnerabilities in, in particular over time. So going back to Heartbleed and, and um, Equifax with Apache Struts, um, you know, we kicked off this year with, with the, the whole Log4J thing. And then, and then, uh, you know, the, uh, the president's executive order, uh, President Biden's executive order, calling out, you know, specifically the importance of the software bill of materials. I think really uh, reflects the, the the sensitivity of the world today. Um, so uh, similar with uh, open source, we can talk about the uh, the frequency. Um, so I've got some you know trends on the code base basis. So this year it was eighty one percent of the code base has had one vulnerability and and 49%, almost half, were high risk. High risk really reflects that they're being exploited and they're pretty easy to, uh, you know, and or that they're pretty easy to exploit. Um, and that's, um, you know, we saw it come down a bit this year. I don't, um, I don't necessarily call that a trend. I would, you know, hold, hold, hold off till next year to see where that's going, but it could be indicative that the, the world is starting to get things under control. On a transaction basis, almost every transaction had some uh, vulnerable components and about 79% were of high risk. And, um, and on a transaction basis, it was a large number of vulnerabilities that we saw. And I will say that it is not necessarily the case that all of these vulnerabilities are exposed um, or that you know, it may, some of them may have been on applications that are internal and companies may have different policies for public facing versus internal, um, but still you know, fair, quite significant. Um, and the reason, and, and uh, again, I, I think we have a knowledgeable audience here, you know, in, in contrast to commercial code where vendors are pushing patches, you know, as you know, um, that's not the way the open source world works. A project doesn't know who its users are and, and there's no sort of push. Projects will, will, will publicize, will put things in the NVD, will, will responsibly disclose, but it's really up to a user or a, I shouldn't say user, a consumer, a, an organization that is, has integrated uh, an open source component to monitor that component and, and, and keep an eye on um, you know, the latest versions and, and security fixes. And um, so th this is really the last set of stats, but uh, this, this is what we call operational factors. And it's, it's kind of related to security in that what we're really talking about is, is how current um, the open source components are in the code base. So um, we look at things like, um, you know, no development in two years, um, components being out of date, and components that were not on the latest version. And you just, so you have, you know, kind of high percentages across the board on both a uh, code base or application basis, as well as a transaction basis. Uh, and really it's, this is indicating little about the open source per se, but indicating that companies are not maintaining the components they use very well. And so the, you know, the typical pattern is a company that doesn't have a process um, to to log, track, monitor, maintain. Um, we'll have developers bringing in components and not 
you know, not staying on top of them, not upgrading over time. And it's not necessarily a problem. There may be a component that's, you know, two years out of date and not being developed anymore and works just fine, but it does indicate some, you know, laxness in the management overall, which will be problematic with other components. So um, conclusions, um, open source um, is now, has become a frequent topic in, in M&A diligence, and it should be. I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, buyers need to understand deal risk and to adjust accordingly, and adjust may mean adjusting the terms of the deal. It may be putting some protections in the reps and, and warranties around the deal. It may be simply adjusting their going forward plans to address any, any issues that show up. Um, and so, uh, you know, the advice would be to include open source um, as part of process diligence. And that's, you know, a, a framework describing best practices would be very useful in that regard. And so certainly, you know, open chain is an important part of that. Um, but also, you know, where, where the rubber meets the road um, is is in the code, and so we would we would uh, suggest that third party audits often often make sense. And in particular, uh, if a company uh, if the target company doesn't seem to have their act together, isn't doing anything like what Open Chain would would prescribe, um, then then the importance of an audit is even is even greater. Um, for sellers, uh, you know, I would my my advice would be um, to be be mindful to understand the issues with open source and to expect that when when the time comes to sell the company, there will be questions. They will be expected to have their open source act together and to be able to provide at least a pretty good idea of what the open source is in the code. And absent that, will likely. Um, be asked to go through an audit. Um, so I would certainly suggest I, I run things through my brother-in-law test. What would I tell my brother-in-law who's a software guy if he started up a company? And I would say, think about at least um, self-certifying with open chain, at least using open chain as a as guidance um, for uh, those things you need to do to be prepared once uh, once due diligence rolls around. So uh, thank you all again for your time and thanks Shane for having me. Um, this, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not live. <laughs> I'm, uh, we've recorded this in advance, but uh, as Shane and I have discussed, if you have questions, we'll be happy to uh, address them. And if you'd like um, a, a paper that kind of outlines what I just talked about today, um, I do have a link here, but I think the easier thing is just go to our website and search for M&A white paper. Um, and, and if you'd like to see the full study, that's, that's pretty prominently featured as well. You could search for, uh, for open source study on the Synopsys site. So that's it. Uh, thank you and uh, have a good day.